Thank you, Professor Holty. Professor Stephen Smale's contributions to topology, geometry, dynamical systems, numerical analysis, and computational complexity theory are fundamental and extensive. To avoid stultification, I'll mention only a small sample of these accomplishments. In his PhD thesis in 1957 at the University of Michigan, among many other results, he proved that it is possible it is possible to turn a sphere inside out smoothly with no cuts or wrinkles. In 1960, while he was visiting the Institute of Pure and Applied Mathematics in Rio de Janeiro, he carried out some of his most renowned work. He devised the well-known Smale Horseshoe, pictures of the first iteration of which appear in your handout brochure, and he settled for all dimensions greater than or equal to five the famous Poincaré conjecture a fundamental conjecture which had been bedeviling topologists since Poincaré first stated it in 1906. This work led to his winning the Fields Medal, the highest award in mathematics. Professor Smale has written of that idyllic time, quote, my best known work was done on the beaches of Rio de Janeiro. When one considers this setting, this work must have required not only Newton quality insight, but also formidable powers of concentration. <laughs> the Fields Medal was awarded to him at the International Congress of Mathematicians in Moscow in 1966. The Vietnam War was dominating the world scene. Upon receiving this award, when the Soviet press interviewed him, Professor Smale castigated the U.S. for its role in the war much to the pleasure of the Soviet newspaper men. Their pleasure evaporated quickly, though, when Professor Smale then leveled equally scathing criticism against the Soviet Union for its suppression of the Hungarian uprising a decade earlier. This outspokenness, together with his work in the free speech movement at Berkeley, did not pass unnoticed. As far as I can determine, Professor Smale is the only recent Nobel Conference speaker to have been issued a subpoena by the House Un-American Activities Committee. <laughs> Eventually, he was fully vindicated. In recent years, between theorems, Professor Smale has traveled the globe, figuratively turning it inside out, searching for collecting and photographing exotic, beautiful minerals. An exhibition of his work is currently on display at an art gallery in Berkeley. He has also, the last couple of years, taken time out to experience firsthand turbulent motion of fluids by sailing a 43-foot yacht to French Polynesia and back with a total crew of only two other mathematicians. <laughs> two years ago, he and his wife spent two weeks in a remote area of Kenya with their daughter. She studying hyenas, while Professor Smale would tease herds of wild elephants by darting among them in his jeep. We are grateful that that jeep didn't fail him, and Professor Smale is here today to speak about the role of mathematics in chaos. Professor Smale. Thanks very much, Ron. It's a great pleasure to be here at this Nobel conference. Testing OK? So uh, today, uh, I'm mainly going to speak on the subject of, uh, of what is chaos, with maybe a little kind of a historical asides. But let me start with, uh, with some of uh, my own personal perspectives on the questions of uh, just uh, how can mathematicians contribute to science? How does mathematics contribute to science? Let me test this out. Uh, is that very visible? In fact, uh, what I want to do is to talk about these uh, perhaps three different rather arbitrary ways in which mathematics contributes to science. Uh, in uh, my own uh, viewpoint, uh, perhaps very uh, biased, is that 
I have them listed in the order of importance. And moreover, I uh, was running up my uh, paper for this uh, proceeding to this conference. I wrote a few paragraphs uh, before I got stalled. And uh, that deals with the first, how mathematicians uh, can make a contribution to science through uh, discovery, as I say it. And so let me read a few of these, a uh, couple of these paragraphs. Since the mathematical universe of the mathematician is much larger than that of the physicist, mathematicians are able to go beyond existing frameworks and see geometrical or analytical structures unavailable to the physicist. Instead of using the particular equations used previously to describe reality, a mathematician has at his disposal an unused world of differential equations to be studied with no a priori constraints. New scientific phenomena, new discoveries may thus be generated. Understanding of the present knowledge may be deepened via the corresponding deductions. As an example, uh, those who anticipated general, general relativity. It was the mathematicians who first saw that geometry did not have to be Euclidean, that there could exist in principle different possible worlds. And uh, also the, uh, the language uh, tensors and all the tools of non-Euclidean geometries were developed before Einstein. And uh, those discoveries were crucial for Einstein's great achievements. Another example of this is uh, found in the history of chaos. Physicists and also mathematicians, many mathematicians as well, were slow to recognize chaotic phenomena because they were oriented towards solving particular equations and analyzing particular solutions. But even a hundred years ago, Poincaré had seen the possibility of homoclinic points by transcending that methodology. Let's see, I have another slide. Uh, I was a little just depressed this morning, uh, though, uh, because I was going to talk uh, in this, here today about trying to uh, explain what homoclinic points are. That's, in fact, kind of the main goal of this talk. I was talking to Heinz Ido Peitgen uh, at breakfast, and he said it took him uh, two months to understand homoclinic points. And uh, so I don't know. Uh, <laughs> maybe I can give some kind of a glimmer of the idea, at least, uh, today. So uh, the, more re the more recent development of the theory of homoclinic points after Poincaré, uh, much after, occurred when mathematicians took the bolder step of looking at the completely arbitrary differential equation, no longer tied to the physical world. This gave the freedom to create geometric constructions, unhampered by specifics. In this broader picture, the centrality of homoclinic phenomena became clear and an appropriate analysis carried out. That analysis was then applied to the traditional equations of engineering systems. Well, to go on uh, a little bit, there's another example of a mathematician's uh, contribution via discovery, I think, is the ruel takens theory of uh, turbulence. The second way that mathematicians have contributed to science is a uh, kind of consolidation of physics. I sort of identify physics and science here uh, too, uh, too crudely, perhaps. But mathematicians have uh, done an important contribution to physics by making uh, the physical theories, which are oftentimes too uh, fleeting. Uh, they come and go uh, too much, perhaps. But sometimes the mathematicians can help nail down those physical theories to give them uh, a great endurance. I'm thinking, uh, first of all, uh, the mathematical foundations of quantum mechanics, where we have a space, spaces of uh, states, Hilbert spaces, with their operators, usually given by differential equations. And that formalism has made a kind of consistency proof of the theory of quantum mechanics, at least. Well, I think not only just for mathematicians, but for scientists in general, that kind of solidification or consolidation has really been important to make uh, quantum mechanics as solid as it is today. Another example is the Lanford proof of the Feigenbaum conjecture. I think uh, 
the, ma the main things were the discoveries of Feigenbaum, but they were consolidated by giving them uh, mathematical proofs. Another example I may mention later is the geometric Lorentz attractor. Lorentz did all this numerical work, which was quite convincing about a strange attractor, but still uh, one doesn't know for sure if, one, if all that numerical uh, simulation was correct. And to have a model given, uh, the model is due to Bob Williams, uh, Guckenheimer, and Jim York, to have a mathematical model which, which was completely understood, which, which looked very much like uh, the numerical work of Lorentz, did consolidate Lorentz's discovery. And I sometimes think that that kind of consolidation is not appreciated by uh, maybe the public at large. There's a, there's a third uh, way in which uh, mathematicians contribute to science, uh, this, this, this descriptive way. And uh, I think that's important too, but perhaps less important than the first two ways because of this aspect that it, if it is just purely descriptive, then uh, there's a kind of phenomenological uh, limit to uh, what is said. And I uh, made some uh, critiques of catastrophe theory along those lines uh, oh, 15 years ago. As an example, Rene Tom uh, would uh, say that the uh, pocket of a kangaroo is the, uh, is the butterfly catastrophe, butterfly catastrophe. Uh, and uh, one couldn't argue with that, but uh, on the other hand, there's a kind of limit, limited insight, just a purely simple description gives. Uh, it's, it's limited. And then uh, the question, uh, which I hear uh, put to me many times, how about my criticisms of catastrophe theory? Does that apply to chaos and uh, fractals? And uh, well, Maybe I won't go that, into that here. <laughs> OK, uh, so then let me go to uh, the main uh, things I want to say, which have to do with uh, trying to give my own uh, picture of what is, uh, what is chaos, trying to try to give some kind of uh, I don't know, maybe a definition if you want, or an assertion. Uh, 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 answer that people would most likely give to the question, what is chaos, is, uh, well, I think Mitch Feigenbaum did that in his talk, a dynamics with a sensitive dependence on initial conditions. And I, it's very hard to argue with that. But perhaps one would like a little uh, more and that is some quality of robustness of the dynamics. When I say robust here, I mean that those properties are preserved under some kind of very minor perturbations of the parameters of the system. And if, for example, you had sensitive dependence and you change the parameters ever so slightly, that dependence would disappear. It would hard, be hard uh, to call that really chaotic, truly. So I'd like to add uh, that the dynamics be robust. And what I want to do now is propose a little different answer to the question, an answer with a mechanism, an answer that chaos is so-and-so, with some kind of, uh, give some kind of deeper picture of what is going on and explain why this definition uh, generates the sensitive dependence and also the robustness. So this uh, assertion here, or definition, will have these properties up here, the sensitive dependence, the robustness, and it will also have a, a, a mechanism involved. And so uh, this statement is, chaos is a dynamics in which there is a homoclinic point. And uh, to be a little more technical, I should say a transverse homoclinic point. So I would like to uh, ex explain that statement and, and defend it. First of all, let me say what a homoclinic point is on a, uh, a very non-mathematical level, non-technical, non-symbolic level. A homoclinic point, uh, I should say a bit of history here. Uh, I've already mentioned Poincaré, and I, as far as I know, uh, Poincaré uh, was the first to really uh, maybe even see homoclinic points at all. Probably was. Homoclinic point, 
uh, that I think the terminology is due to Poincare also. Uh, it's a state of a, uh, of a system which if you go forward in time, take that state, go forward in time, you reach an equilibrium. And if you go backwards in time, you reach the same equilibrium. And you could replace more generally the notion of equilibrium with a periodic solution. So this seems like a fairly uh, harmless kind of a phenomena. Just a, a state which in forward in time goes to the same place where it went backwards in time. This, this seems really an innocuous kind of statement. Uh, but I'll try to communicate how this is such a powerful idea that it really uh, can be identified with the notion of chaos in, a, in some reasonable sense. When I say uh, this is a, a definition of chaos, is the existence of a homoclinic point, I'm not saying it is the definition of chaos. I think there could be many definitions for chaos as there is for most things. And I'm just proposing one definition which I like a lot. The definition that chaos is a dynamics which possesses a homoclinic point. Okay, so this is the, uh, you know, this is a, a true statement, but I want to be a little more mathematical about, uh, about this, give a little more, sli slightly more technical definition of homoclinic point, and eventually uh, construct them and try to see how they work. Okay, let me start at the beginning. I'm going to just say, say even what is a dynamics. Okay, so dynamics, uh, and uh, for our purposes, it's going to be a special case, but uh, just about everything I say generalizes completely to arbitrary number of variables, to continuous time, just in very general uh, setting. So, but the dynamics I'm going to use to uh, illustrate everything is a dynamics in the plane. So I'm thinking now of a state in the plane, which I, mathematicians say R2. It's the Cartesian plane, if you want, with x and y axes. And I'm going to take time to be discrete and reversible. So time is given as the, with values 0 for the present, 1 is the next one unit of time later, and so on. Minus one will be uh, one unit of time ago. And I will uh, write for a state z, I will write z sub t to be the state which satisfies the initial condition. That at time zero, z sub t was the original z. But at z2, then z2 will be that state two units of time later. Okay, all this is very uh, elementary and known to many of you, I'm sure. So we can write the orbit of z, the trajectory of z, that state throughout time, as uh, so and so these dots go to z minus 1, z 0, z 1, z 2, z 3, and so on. That will be the sequence of states which uh, are generated by that initial state z at time 0. Then, uh, from the hypothesis that I've said, we can express the next state by a transformation. So I write capital T as a transformation of the plane. And that gives us the value of the next state. So I put any state in our uh, equation here. I will produce the next state by this transformation, invertible transformation of the plane. Now, for many of you, this is getting, might be a little uh, tricky, but uh, I'll, I'll give an example. And I'll give an example which is going to be a simple example, but if we really understand that example, we will be on our way to understanding homoclinic points. Okay, so uh, the example I'm giving is not chaotic. It's a linear dynamics. And uh, we have this picture. I, don't, I hope that's visible. Uh, it's not too visible to me, but uh, it's, it's okay. It should be higher, like this. Oh, okay, there's a little bit on the bottom there, isn't there? Okay, all right. So this is an example uh, of a uh, transformation 
of the plane. I better move it down a bit. Huh? Yeah, there's the transformation T in this case, given in terms of Cartesian coordinates x and y. So uh, if we take a point, for example, z0 in the plane, so z0 will be a state. We want to see where z1 is a unit of time later, we apply this little tiny formula. We take the x coordinate, double it. Take the y coordinate, take half of that. So we move down here by half and out here by two and we get this point z1. So this dynamics takes this state to that state in one unit of time. Then if we apply the dynamics again, we move down by half and over by two and we get a point somewhere over here. So points are moving like these arrows direct us. If we apply it again, then we go out here somewhere. So points like this are going to be moving along in a hyperbolic-like shape under time. Oh, and I think this example is, uh, even though it's very simple, non-chaotic linear, if we understand the dynamics of this example, we're already on our way to seeing s something about homoclinic points. No homoclinic points here. So let's look at a few other points, see what happens to some other points as time progresses. If we take a point over here, again, we double down here and move over. So a point here is going to move like this and again like that. You have this kind of what mathematicians call a saddle kind of structure to this point. Zero is constant. Zero doesn't change in time. Zero is an equilibrium of the system. If we take a point on the axis here, on the y-axis, so that x is zero, then each time we apply that dynamics, we take half of it. So it'll go down here, 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 approaching the equilibrium as time goes to infinity if it lies on the, that axis. The same if we are in the uh, negative y-axis, the point here will be uh, halved and go up here. And so we have this phenomena of the set of points which move into the equilibrium are precisely the y-axis. That's, uh, we'll see a little more generally, that's called the stable manifold. And this is one of the most important things I think that modern dynamical systems has given us is this focus on the stable manifolds of an equilibrium, the set of points which are attracted to it. As in this picture here, the set of points which are attracted to the equilibrium are precisely that one-dimensional straight line. The other points are moving away. If a point is not on that y-axis is going to be moving away from the y-axis, moving away from our equilibrium at zero. And we have some points which, as time goes to negative infinity, do the same thing that mathematicians call the unstable manifold, WU, the set of points which move to the equilibrium as time goes to minus infinity. Okay, so we have this kind of structure of our linear transformation, the two axes, the x-axis and the y-axis, which give us the set of points which are asymptotic to the equilibrium, asymptotic to the equilibrium as time goes to plus or minus infinity. Okay, so I hope that I've given you some idea of this particular example because that's, as I say, going to be quite important for us. Okay, then as I said before, if we have a general dynamics, the equilibrium is a fixed point. It's a state which does not change under time. It's given by the equation T of P equals P. This means for all time, that state remains stationary. An equilibrium is a stationary state. And we can define for any equilibrium, the stable manifold W S of P this important, what I call this important development, is simply the set of x, which is the property that the orbit tends to p as t goes to infinity. And the unstable manifold, same thing as t goes to minus infinity. So we have this uh, definition then, which works very generally for dynamics and is one of the most important global aspects of dynamical systems, which I think was an important thing in beginning to understand chaos, the, the use systematic use of these sets which are asymptotic to an equilibrium. 
And it's natural, if you want to see what happens to a state in the long run, you want to see where it goes. And that's exactly what's happening here. You're looking at the set of points which tend towards the equilibrium. Okay. <clears throat> now I want to go beyond that linear example by a small perturbation. So what happens if we perturb the linear example a little bit? Yeah, tell me if I'm off the picture sometimes. I guess that catches the main thing. Okay, so what I've done here is suppose we have some kind of uh, change in the parameters of the dynamics. Not very big, but just a small change in the parameters of the dynamical system, which was given on the previous slide, to make it nonlinear. So, so there's a different dynamics now. And so what has happened now is that that set of points which are asymptotic to the equilibrium P, we still have an equilibrium P, the set of points will no longer be a straight line but a curved line like this. So all these points are going to be marching down here under time. These points also are going to be marching towards P under time. The points in WU of P that I've marked here are going to be marching away from P along, precisely along this curve WU of P. And other points are going to look much like in the picture of the linear case, Z0 will map to here like this, Z1 over here. So these other points are going to be marching along here until they get to the influence of this set, and then they're going to be marching out. So we have this picture. I should uh, let's see. Uh, did I lose it? Yeah. Now this picture here, we already see the phenomena, which is crucial for chaos. We have a strong contraction of points in the direction, in the y direction, in the vertical direction. Points are being shrunk because of this half in the formula. These points are being shrunk. Points in the x-direction are being expanded by the factor 2, so the points here are being pushed apart. So we have the contraction along here and the expansion along here. And that's, uh, I think, one of the crucial features, signatures of chaos. And that situation prevails over here in this picture, which is no longer linear. The points over here are going to be moving along here until they get down close to this and then moving out here like this. So you have these lines here, like this. When I draw a curve like that, I do not mean that we have a differential equation with a flow, just that points are going to be marching along in the direction of that arrow under our discrete time of this dynamics. Okay, so we perturbed our linear situation a little bit, still no homoclinic points, no chaos. And the picture of the dynamics here is very similar to that of our linear example. But now we want to do it a little bit further. We want to make a little further perturbation. So now we have uh, something which might be called strongly nonlinear or a, uh, maybe altogether a big perturbation. It's a perturbation in such a way that you have a crossing now of these, these uh, curves, these stable and unstable sets or manifolds. Now we suppose cross at a point Q. Okay, well, what does that mean? Remember I said a homoclinic point was a point which tended to equilibrium as time goes to infinity and as time goes to minus infinity. So that means precisely an intersection of this curve with that curve. So from what I've said so far, we can see a homoclinic point is precisely an intersection, Q, then belonging to WS, intersection WU and it's not the equilibrium itself. That's a homoclinic point, one that tends to equilibrium forward in time and backward in time. Okay, and the transverse, the technical condition, means that the crossing here is not tangential. A minor technical condition. Okay, so here we've uh, been a little bit more geometric about our definition of homoclinic points. We see the kind of situation where they might occur. Still a lot needs to be said. And especially 
we want to go to the question, how does this uh, give us chaos? How is this going to uh, say anything about chaos? Simply just a, a crossing like that. It looks harmless enough. It doesn't look like it should uh, produce chaotic dynamics. Uh, okay, but uh, let me then try to look at some of the consequences of the, just simply the existence of those homoclinic point forces. Some of the consequences. Okay. Well, uh, the points on this curve are invariant. So if I apply the dynamics to Q, it will stay on this curve. It will also stay on the curve uh, which goes in negative time to P. So a homoclinic point is preserved under the dynamics. Okay. So if I draw it this way, it means that the transformation is going to have to take Q to a point down here, Q, say Q1, which is also a homoclinic point. So Q gets mapped in the, under the dynamics into a point which also lies on this curve. Okay? And s since we have to preserve this crossing, it's going to look a little bit like this. So the transformation is going to take these points into these points. Well, how, how can that be? Well, the only way for that to happen is for this curve to double around like this. So if we have a homoclinic point, it forces this bending around. Just the existence of a homoclinic point forces this picture. But moreover, if we go backwards in time, this point Q must also go back here to a point Q minus one, one unit of time later on this curve. So it forces the same kind of picture like this. So we've seen just from the existence of the homoclinic point, we begin to see a little bit of uh, things that we could say is this getting a little complicated, which, which is true enough. I drew a, I have a, another little better picture of the same thing here. Uh, so this is a, the uh, picture that we've deduced simply by the existence of Q. Okay, well now we can apply the same argument again. This point is a homoclinic point now, so its image will have to be down here, something of the same type, Q2. And so we can argue that this must curve in here, like this. And now we see as we're getting under the influence of this curve, it's going to be pulled out, like this maybe, or perhaps pulled out farther and come back crossing through here. So this situation forces a bigger loop down here. The loop is getting bigger because of the stretching along W of P. So we have this stretching effect. And if we do it again, it gets stretched still more, and it's going to come in here like this. So we, in fact, we get more homoclinic points crossing here. We've created more of them. From the first one, we not only have T of Q, T squared, as Q2 units of time, where we get completely new homoclinic points forced by this picture. Well, now we make the same argument on these. Uh, Poincaré wrote that I will not try to draw uh, the figure uh, implied by the existence of a homoclinic point, and I think maybe I better stop. But, uh, Here's the same thing, maybe a little cleaner. Uh, you get the new homoclinic point there where the same analysis applies to that. That creates more, many more new ones and you pretty, pretty soon you get confused. I hope I've communicated a little bit of why this kind of complication follows from our original assertion of just the existence of the homoclinic point. But how to deal with this? Uh, well, this complication. One can't quite say this is chaos so far. This is just a mess. <laughs> but maybe it's suggestive that this could be chaos. And in fact, as I asserted, uh, chaos is the existence of a homoclinic point. I need to do some uh, more justification. So what we'll do is we'll to take in our original picture, uh, if I have that very handy here, yeah. No, the original picture is messed up. Uh, but the original picture, remember, uh, 
of a homoclinic point looks something like this. Here is our P, and here is our Q. So remember now we're shrinking along this arrow. We're shrinking in and we're expanding along this arrow from P to Q this way, shrinking this way. So what I'll do is to take a little rectangle which covers that area. I take a little rectangle like that. I take a little rectangle like that and that's going to be shrunk in this way and pushed out this way. So if I take that rectangle in the picture, if we look at it sufficiently number of uh, units of time later, it's going to be pushed out along here. So we have this picture. This rectangle is being shrunk in this direction and expanded in this direction to give us this new rectangle which is just placed over it with our point P in here. Okay, so let's try to straighten that out. But this, this then is just going to motivate this picture which uh, is drawn in our program even, uh, the, the, hor the horseshoe. So if we just take this and we make one of these rectangles into a square, we get this picture. So we keep we keep the same general configuration, but just put it into a little more place where we can analyze it. So now we have the square here. There's, well, I messed up the square, but it's a, you can see it's, it's almost a square. And by the construction, it gets shrunk this way and expanded this way. So it's, it's shrunk in this, this way and expanded, expanded out in this way. So it gave us a long, thin rectangle and bend it around and then place it back here. And we get this. So what, what is going on here is the following. We have the square is mapped onto this bent rectangle in such a way it takes A, D, this line into A prime, D prime. And it gets bent around and if you think through then, this gets turned around so that B, C gets upside down and we get C prime, B prime. So the idea is that C goes to C prime. And so this rectangle gets mapped into the horseshoe. And uh, if we are a little careful, we can see that if we have a homoclinic point, we must have this picture. And this is very, very general statement, it works in arbitrary dimensions, and any kind of topological situation, any kind of uh, dynamics. You will get this picture from or a slight generalization of this picture from the existence of a homoclinic point. Okay, so now let's just forget about the homoclinic point, which was quite confusing, and let's just look at the dynamics of this picture in its own right. Forget what happened before, and suppose we have a dynamics given by just these boundary conditions. What does that dynamics look like, and what can one say about it? Okay, well, let me just start this analysis and indicate how it goes. Uh, we look first of all at the set of points which go into this dotted rectangle. And if you follow uh, through on this, uh, on this picture here, you can see the set of points which go into uh, a piece like this. There's a, there's a little thick strip here and that will be a strip like that here. So the set of points which are transformed into this long horizontal rectangle come from this vertical thin rectangle. So this gets mapped into here. Similarly, this rectangle, this long thin one, gets mapped into th this one down here. And one can s analyze the set of all points which persist in this square under all time, forward and backwards. They will be labeled by what time they're in this rectangle or this rectangle. So we just mark zero here, one here. Say zero here and one here. And we label a point by the rectangle that lies at time t. So that gives us for each time a zero or one. And that way to each, each orbit of this dynamics, we have a sequence of zeros and ones. And one can show that uh, any sequence of zeros and ones can be produced this way so that the dynamics here of all the points which persist under all time, forward and backwards, all those points correspond to sequences of zeros and ones with a decimal point. 
and the dynamics itself corresponds to moving the point one place. So the dynamics is now just this. Okay, what's the point of all this? Well, what that does is to reduce the qualitative dynamical picture to this combinatorial picture. And in that picture, and this picture is of zeros and ones, one can, uh, and that had already been done for uh, 50 years or so, answer all the dynamical, almost all the dynamical questions can be answered by combinatorial playing around with these sequences of zeros and ones. One can say something about the periodic points, being close to the homoclinic points, one can read off the homoclinic points from here. And so one can interpret all this now to points in here. So the homoclinic points will now correspond to a certain subset of these sequences of zeros and ones. So some uh, consequences we obtain uh, from all this. Uh, so first of all, one can take do the following, one can just define a map which uh, what looks like a horseshoe. It's easy to do. One just takes uh, that square, thin it out, and, and do that procedure I mentioned before to actually describe a dynamics which looks like this. So that kind of dynamics does exist, and we get immediately homoclinic points do exist. Something that, uh, for example, Poincaré I was uh, never able to do. I don't know if he ever tried. In fact, in those days, I don't think they tried too hard to prove theorems. But uh, in any case, it would have been difficult for Poincaré to try to prove the existence of homoclinic points. He visioned them. He could see them. He believed in them. But uh, you know, it's hard for uh, him to be able to really assert their existence in any kind of uh, rigor or any kind of a constructive way. That he didn't have the way to construct the homoclinic points. So we obtain by going one way in this picture, we obtain by going, starting with the horseshoe, we get the existence of homoclinic points. Then we can also analyze the homoclinic points, as I said. We conclude uh, lots of these questions about uh, nearby periodic points. Uh, sensitive dependence now follows from the picture. If you look at it very carefully, you see the sensitive dependence on initial conditions. And that goes back to these contractions and expansions the contractions and expansions, you see all the points which persist in that square do have sensitive dependence. Moreover, we get the robustness of the same. That picture is robust. So that means that if the dynamics has that, it's going to persist under any kind of, a, any kind of a perturbations. OK, well, let me give a little of the historical uh, picture here. Jim Glick, uh, in his book Chaos, uh, I think has a nice, uh, accurate uh, account of uh, the horseshoe. Uh, let me just uh, detail uh, some aspects of his account. So that's in, the, in the background here, we should keep in mind that homoclinic points had been, to a great extent, uh, lost. Punker had found them and everything. And Burkhoff had, uh, had done some nice things with him. But when I was working in differential equations in 1959, the whole community was unaware of homoclinic points. Everybody I talked to seemed to be unaware of the existence of homoclinic points. And I, talking to people even today, they said that's a pretty prevalent phenomenon that nobody knew what homoclinic points was, were in 1959. I shouldn't say everybody, but essentially they weren't part of the culture. Uh, Cartwright and Littlewood, uh, great English mathematicians, uh, during the war were uh, given some problems on uh, understanding the uh, equations of electrical circuits. It's part of some war work they were doing. And they uh, had a maybe a 100 or 200 page article which gave a lot of analysis of this very simple differential equations, uh, two variables plus forcing plus time where they noticed a lot of very interesting phenomena, complicated phenomena, like an infinite number of periodic solutions. And they uh, detailed this out in a great but almost unreadable paper of 100, this long, long paper, which I don't think people read except for Norman Levinson. Uh, actually, uh, Mary Cartwright is still alive. Uh, 
I visited her at, uh, I guess it was Girton College, I think, uh, so Oxford or Cambridge, probably uh, Cambridge. Uh, Norman Levinson, an American, uh, simplified some of the differential equations in this paper of Cartwright and Littlewood and pulled out some of that exotic uh, behavior. Uh, I was uh, on the beaches of Rio de Janeiro uh, in 1960. Uh, besides swimming, I was doing some mathematics. I was there for six months. And uh, at that time, I received a letter from Norman Levinson, which uh, said that uh, some conjecture I had made uh, was wrong. And he gave us an example, his paper. Well, I spent a lot of time trying to understand uh, his paper in a m more geometric way. It was at that time that I uh, made this, gave this horseshoe picture. And in fact, uh, so that was in 1960. And The Mathematics of Time by Springer, it's a book uh, of mine, 1980. There I have an essay uh, on how I got started in dynamical systems, which gives a somewhat detailed account of, uh, of all these things. So summarizing a little bit, uh, we have a, this little diagram. Chaos, uh, I've asserted and given some kind of justification, one has to give a lot more, can be identified with homoclinic points. I think it's fair to say there are some borderline cases which one might call chaos, but not homoclinic. Some very borderline cases. But I think essentially it's, a, uh, it's not bad to make this identification. And the homoclinic points can truly mathematically rigorously be identified with a horseshoe, generally. But that's not really the, uh, the whole story. Because what I've talked about is a kind of a, I use chaos in a very kind of general sense. One can talk about something which might, one might call full chaos. Full chaos means that uh, chaotic behavior for essentially all states, states with probability one. And in the picture I've described of the homoclinic point in the horseshoe, it only guarantees the chaotic behavior of some set of points uh, ex except for uh, a, a little while. Let me go back to this. Uh, I don't know if I have it very well here, but uh, that. See, see, in this, in the horseshoe, if we look at the set of points which really stay in this square here, we get something like a Cantor set of points. And so what happens at any point which tends to the Cantor set, that will be truly chaotic. So that's a set of uh, measure zero, dimension one, at least, or more. So. Uh, we don't get a set of uh, probability one. We don't get a, a set of full measure which is chaotic. Now, I think a lot of research has vindicated this lately, uh, that points will t can very well tend to stay in this chaotic region much more long than one would have a reason to suspect. So the points can march in here even though they're not on this Cantor set, but they will stay here for a long, long time acting chaotically and eventually may go go away to a stable solution. So you have this transition, uh, transitory chaos, uh, transient chaos, uh, which works for um, many, many points, not just a thin set of points, but many, many points. But still, one would like to talk about something where points with probability one are chaotic. And so that's a question of an, uh, looking at a, an attractor, a chaotic attractor or a strange attractor. Let me call them a chaotic attractor. So full chaos means that states with full probability will behave chaotically. And I have this picture. Full chaos implies chaos. And the chaos itself has homoclinic points, so certainly full chaos will also have homoclinic points. So we have this idea now of an attracting set like this so that all points nearby will tend to that that chaotic attractor. So you have all these points, a set of full measure going asymptotically to this chaotic set, which will then give us a full sense of chaos, a full definition of chaos. And uh, I think it uh, remains uh, a major questions in the science as to whether uh, the chaotic phenomena we see can be explained or not by transient chaos, or does it need 
uh, uh, full chaos to explain them. I, uh, I think those kind of questions are not, not really understood. An example of a chaotic attractor is the Lorentz attractor. And in that situation, surely uh, states with full probability will act chaotically for all time. So let me uh, close now with a uh, couple of uh, pro some problems. And for me, an, uh, a major problem of science, of science of chaos, turbulence two, is to identify chaotic attractors in physical systems. Uh, if we do that, then we can say that we really have proved the existence in that physical system of full chaos. I think that has not been done ever to my satisfaction. And to, uh, in general, I think uh, it's hard to think, it's hard to justify that that's ever been done to uh, strongly identify, or really uh, solidly identify a chaotic attractor in a physical system. One can do that in mathematically constructed systems. In geometrically constructed systems, one can do that very easily, and there's a whole uh, slew of lots of examples where one has full chaos. But in th the systems from physics, it seems to be a very, very difficult system, a very, very difficult problem. And, and I'm not asking necessarily for a rigorous proof, but just some kind of solid proof where one uh, really understands the numerics, which proves, uh, gives numerical simulation, or the uh, mathematics of the equations, on uh, some even less than rigorous level, try to make this identification, I think, I won't say the major problem of chaos, but it certainly, to me, is a major problem of chaos, to make that identif identification. And it could turn out to be uh, the situation that really uh, gives some understanding of turbulence, for example, or this could be done with the equations of uh, fluid motion. If that could be done with equations of fluid motion uh, under uh, realistic circumstances, this kind of uh, result could give us an understanding of turbulence. Uh, so particular examples of this problem, uh, for example here, th this uh, equations of Lorentz we know numerically what they look like. They look like they have a strange attractor. And that simulation has inspired the, uh, this work on the geometric Lorentz attractor I've mentioned, which is understood completely. But one has not connected this up with this. So mathematically, one has not proved the existence of any kind of an attractor for the Lorentz equations, what, those equations which helped inspire uh, this whole movement uh, towards uh, chaos theory. In that situation, that most classical situation of chaos, one believes that there is a strange attractor, but it's not proved at all. Uh, you can say it's an academic question, and some physicists would say it's an academic question, but I don't think so. I think there's some missing link here. And until one really understands that, this question, it may well be there's something conceptual that's very important uh, that we don't understand about chaos until this, is, uh, this question is understood. This is a very special case of the question I mentioned of identifying the equations in physics with uh, a strange attractor. Of course, one could say the Lorentz equations aren't exactly physical, but at least they had some kind of original motivation in the equations of weather. And uh, the final one uh, question, uh, well, I'm into question these days. I gave a... Uh, talk in uh, May uh, on nonlinear uh, systems in my uh, paper, uh, which is finished now, was entitled Dynamics Retrospective, Great Problems, Attempts That Failed. So I talk about all the things I couldn't do for many years. And uh, as many of you know, I didn't, haven't worked too much in uh, dynamics or chaos since the uh, 60s. And so, uh, as I say, uh, uh, the reader should consider this note as reflecting a voice out of the past. And I list uh, 10 uh, problems which I consider great problems of, uh, of dynamics, uh, problems uh, that I find very hard, couldn't do. Two of them are these problems. Do the Navier-Stokes equations possess a chaotic attractor? I posed a very particular case of this problem and the Lorentz problem. In any case, let me stop there. Thanks very much.